So good morning. I'm Carrie O'Donnell, um, the founder of Alchemy, and uh, I am so excited to uh, facilitate this conversation today. Um, we have two amazing panelists. And then, of course, we have Brett Christie, who is uh, my facilitation guide on the side, and he uh, he has a deep, deep expertise in AI, too, and may throw in a few comments here or there um, if he's got anything that he'd like to add. So um, I'd like to introduce you. Um, so keep introducing yourselves. Oh, my goodness. I guess we're, people are still coming in, so maybe we'll just... That's okay. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, our our two panelists today who I'm thrilled to have with us. So first is Vin Del Casino. He's the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at San Jose State University. And he formerly had a number of leadership roles at University of Arizona, including Interim Senior Vice Provost and Vice President for Academic Initiatives and Student Success. He's a visionary leader on innovative teaching and learning. And uh, Vin has been writing about the future of machine learning and scaling innovation in higher ed since long before the pandemic and launch of ChatGPT, including an article, Machine Learning Big Data in the Future of Higher Ed, in Inside Higher Ed, and then an article that we're going to refer to today on uh, at, um, equity um, and tech equity in higher ed. So our second panelist is, is Dave Weil from uh, the Vice President, Chief Information and Analytics Officer at Ithaca College. And Dave's a national thought leader in higher education IT. And he's been working with Educause to help develop and explore the concept of digital transformation and how it can serve as a catalyst for advancing the mission of higher ed institutions. His insights have been fe featured in publications and programs sponsored by Educause, Inside Higher Ed, The Chronicle, Campus Technology, and many more. Um, and we'll refer today to his February piece in Inside Higher Ed called Seven Question College Questions College Leaders Should Ask About AI. Now, if you haven't been to one of our webinars, um, you will know, you might not know that um, we're all about participation and uh, communication and chat and bringing you in. And Brett is just the master of, of monitoring the chat and and he will bring in questions or comments as he sees fit um, throughout the webinar. So please feel free to weigh in with your thoughts, your comments, your questions as we're going through this. Um, so we're going to break this into kind of four little sections. The first is we're going to have an overview conversation because we think that you can't really dig into equity and ethics until you actually talk more broadly about what is the AI conversation with for leaders on campus. This is part of our leadership series. So we're really focused on how do higher education leaders lead in this world of AI. Um, so, and then we're gonna talk about equity in AI. We're gonna do a Padlet, which we often do and get your thoughts and hear what's happening at your campuses. And then we'll talk about um, ethics in AI. So um, I'm gonna start right now by, um, you know, just asking each of you to give me to your sense of your approach on AI in your campus. And Vin, you know, how are you approaching AI at San Jose, at San Jose State, which is sitting right in the heart of Silicon Valley? Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing that. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I mean, there's the the kind of velocity of movement is meaning that you have to be very tactical at some level and there's a certain level there's a certain number of tactics like that we've been involved in you know thinking about policy what is the question of how do you engage digital and creative literacy what are what are the ways in which you're looking at partners what kind of infrastructure do you have and so you're you're kind of having to respond in the moment on a tactical level the thing though is your tactics have to operate within a strategic frame and so we're trying to think through what is that strategic frame what is the long term sort of strategies here and so we're intentionally developing expertise we're going out and hiring over the next couple of years 50 to 80 faculty who work at the intersection of ai machine learning science and technology studies we're trying to do that in areas like social robotics and in anthropology all the way to health sciences Try to build out programming in Computer Science Plus, try to connect people, 
new degrees in quantum computing, other things like that, developing corporate partnerships and strategy, also developing strategies with the city of San Jose on the civic and social good, smart technology, smart cities, those kind of things. So we have that kind of strategic umbrella we're trying to operate in while we're also dealing with the day-to-day -day tactics of everything that's going on in a in an unbelievably evolve, uh, quickly evolving economy where people are in and out of jobs around this valley very fast. Interesting. One thing you mentioned to me when we talked earlier was that yeah, I loved your, you, you, you said, you know, rather than creating man, manifestos at San Jose State, you're really trying to create a, drive a conversation with all the stakeholders. And maybe you could just give us some thoughts for other people thinking about this. Yeah. You know, the first panic moment when, you know, ChatGPT hit the world was we've got to rewrite everything. And where is our technology to detect AI in an AI world? And I'm, I actually walked into a, a Senate meeting and I said, well, you could spend the rest of your life adjudicating debates between AI and machine learning algorithms of which one detected what cheating, or we could think broadly about how we're going to change teaching and learning in a way that means we're not worried about AI and the way in which it intersects. Now, there are some spaces where you still have to deal tactically with the reality of you know, chat GPT written work, but we're trying to develop infrastructure and strategies and training programs so people can think, how is pedagogy evolving in a world in which AI is infusing across the board? And that's what I mean by lifting up and not just coming up with a steadfast, like this is the way in which everyone will do it. We've got to let people evolve. And in some cases, faculty are like, not only are they engaging, you know, AI machine learning, they're embedding it in the how they're teaching and not just about it, but actually using the tools and then co-developing them with students. So that's the broader frame in which all this happens as opposed to just going, all right, we've got one approach to this. We're not at that point, I think, in higher ed to say there's one approach here, given the the just the rapid way in which that tech those technologies are changing how we think about ourselves in the world. Yeah, it's funny. One of the panels that um, I facilitated earlier this year, um, you know, I think actually it was uh, Melody Buckner from University of Arizona said, oh, we're putting everything in pencil. <laughs> it's nothing's in ink. <laughs> I love that thinking because it's really how it how it has to happen. Uh, so, Dave, you know, you've you know, what's your approach at Ithaca? So Ithaca is a very different institution. We're about 5,000 students private. Uh, we have professional schools with a liberal arts core. Uh, and so trying to think about the role of AI in this environment uh, has been very intentional. And we're looking at it, uh, one, you know, both on the uh, student experience side and also in the classroom. So, and then also the third uh, leg of the stool is how does it improve the efficiencies of our operations? But doing that in a context where we don't, I mean, we don't have a supercomputer cluster. We don't have some of the other resources that some of the larger institutions do have. So what's the right way to approach this um, at an institution of, of our size? And I think, you know, some of it is leveraging our existing uh, structures, our existing processes, we're partnering with our uh, Center for Faculty Excellence, uh, working with faculty to have them explore the use of AI in the classroom. We've created these mini grants that have been astronomically um, successful where we are providing some seed money to faculty who just wanna experiment on little um, uses of AI uh, there. Um, I'm leveraging actually my analytics team to explore uh, building out um, AI tools that uh, can help with the student experience. So we are looking at uh, an AI tool that will enhance the service desk experience. And then the idea is to take that and then scale it to allow that uh, AI uh, interface to work for the registrar or, or facilities or, or other services as well. But again, trying to build on um, either existing services or relationships with uh, third-party vendors to do that, um, given the resources that we have. Cool. Um, you wrote, David, you wrote this article recently on the seven questions. I'm going to pop it up for a second here. 
um, seven questions leaders should ask about AI. And, you know, before we dig into, uh, uh, you know, we're, before we dig into uh, ethics and equity, maybe you could just talk a little bit about, you know, how institutions can build a better framework or build a framework that will and will um, enable this. Sure. So we really think that, you know, we need to be thinking intentionally about uh, the impact of AI on our institutions. And uh, these seven questions are sort of designed to get us thinking. And we're really using this as the framework for our exploration. Uh, we are establishing a presidential working group on AI, like a lot of institutions have done. And we're sort of systematically working through these questions. Um, you know, so it's everything from, you know, up front, what's the impact on our curriculum and the, and the pedagogy uh, related to the skills that we are helping to um, build in our students. But I think there are also some other fundamental questions that are really important. And, and uh, number six is one of my favorites, which is how does AI and its use align with our institutional philosophy approach and core values? For example, at an Ithaca, is it um, okay for us to use AI for admission decisions or to help uh, identify if a student is struggling academically or having mental health uh, issues or things there? So I think really as we explore use cases, and it does tie into um, ethics uh, as well, is really understanding what are the core values of the institution and then how does AI and the use of AI fit in with that? And I think that's a key thing for people to be thinking about. Um, also, you know, how um, does AI help with just the student experience as a whole? Uh, at, at Ithaca, which is a residential, primarily residential uh, institution, the experience that a student has on campus is critical to their success. And today, students uh, have, you know, friction as they are trying to get services, they may have to tell their story multiple times, things like that. And I think there's a huge potential uh, for AI to help with that. So again, these seven questions are really designed to help frame our thinking and uh, around the use of AI. Great. Um, and um, any, uh, what I'd love to say is, are others of you, do you have kind of dialogues or questions or kind of frames that you're looking at? And if so, pop them into chat and we can we can um, hopefully weave some of that into this conversation later. Um, I'm gonna turn us to um, the question of equity in, um, in AI and start with some thinking that uh, Vin did um, before pre-COVID, pre, -COVID, pre uh, pre-chat GPT. And here's another article that he wrote in Evolution um, around tech equity in higher education. Um, and so, Vin, maybe you could speak to that for a moment. Yeah, no, I, you know, the really, I love what David said, you know, we've definitely, you know, developed uh, an infrastructure around discussions around artificial intelligence, machine learning, and things like that as well, while also simultaneously kind of going through things. And when I wrote this piece in the evolution, I'm sitting in the heart of Silicon Valley and going, all right, how how is the infrastructure going to enable this? You know, um, and and I started thinking, what are the practical sorts of things that I think institutions need to have? And I will tell you, we run like four four different levels of Wi-Fi on the campus right now. It means like accessing data and information is challenging. Dave mentioned, you know, supercomputing, but access to high performance computing is almost a core requirement to teach a lot of fields now. And a lot of it can be done on, in the cloud, but some of it actually needs to be done on prem, you know, on the institute at the institution itself. And to be able to afford that and maintain it and have the IT infrastructure for it is a real challenge. And so if you think about the future of access to careers for the diverse students, and we're 80 something percent students of color at San Jose State, 42 percent first generation who have figured out how to live in this valley. If they're not going to be able to access the jobs of the future, if they're not trained in an environment that they're going to walk into. 
And so there is a core equity challenge right now in infrastructure access. And I think it's under discussed. And I think it is the it's it is the next great digital divide. If access to inter, uh, broadband was the issue of the 2010s, I think the future is tied to the ability to manage assets at scale, create open source technologies, build interdisciplinary tech uh, tech education, and have the access to high performance computing and other infrastructures that you need to work in the world that everyone's walking into now. And that's in the field of education all the way to the computer science degrees we're offering, right? And that's a real challenge for institutions that are working on the marginal dollars, particularly in the public sector. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that really strikes me. I mean, the Cal State University system is a model regional university system that has uh, that is resource constrained. And, and what are some of the things that you're doing at San Jose? I know you've got some really great partnerships that are helping you to ensure that broadband, that uh, that you know, supercomputing tech access. Yeah, so you know we're trying to create partnerships. Nvidia is right down the road. It's one of the largest you know players now in AI. We've got a fellows program with their, them. We actually have about ten faculty are going to go over and work with Nvidia and think about training and education. We have been able to generate grants and contracts and some philanthropic work to support. A high performance computing infrastructure and things like that so students can train in that space. Um, our Adobe partnership has been very big. Adobe is right down the street as well. And we're one of three Adobe for all campuses. And they've made a pretty big investment in us, particularly to help students think about how the future of digital and creative literacies, which are now intersecting with AI machine learning algorithms on an everyday basis. So trying to produce do as much as we can through the various partnerships, also with the city of San Jose and with foundations. We're in the process of building sort of a program around AI for civic and social good, smart government and other things like that with the city of San Jose. So we're both trying to address challenges and how do we think about that partnership? And I think so it's, it's about public, public and public, private and trying to bring all those different infrastructures and uh, resources that each one of those areas have as best we can to advance the research and teaching and student experience here at San Jose. It's awesome. I, we, yeah, Dave, go, go, Dave. And, and I want to bring you, yeah, keep, go, because then I have a question for you. Keep, go, go. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Vince, in your article, uh, something that wasn't on the slide, but I think is so critical as you talk about the importance of data privacy, and data management. I think, yeah. you know, as we really start exploring AI, not exploring or utilizing AI, it truly is about the data because the AI, um, the AI tools, um, have to, you know, they work on their training and their training data. And the, the, the most powerful tools are the ones that are going to leverage institutional data that we have here. But how do we, how are we storing that data? How are we governing the data? How are we controlling who has access to the data? And how are we cleaning the data? Um, you know, in the old days, uh, you might have web pages out there that just sort of wither out there. They're just staying, they're not linked to anything, but they just stay up there. And it's like, that was sort of okay. But if you're using AI and you have data in the database, any place, or even on the web, AI is going to pick that up. It's going to get trained on it and it's going to give you incorrect information and stuff. So data is such a critical component. I was really glad to see you mention it. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that the privacy and equity and ethics issue all tie together because more and more people are like, I want to manage my data relationship, my personal sure. data relationship to these systems. But you're 100% right. Junk in produces junk out. And um, we had a conversation recently about moving to a certain technology. And we're like, until we clean up the data infrastructure, it's not going to work right. But I think that question of privacy and the ability to manage one's own personal relationship is critical both in how we teach students in data literacy, but also then how we build infrastructure with them. 
Um, and it is a real challenge, I think, to think about when we've been building degrees around the question of data and information, just to start to think about what that future looks like. You're 100 percent. right. There's also institutional tension there because um, students want us to be proactive in reaching out to them. Hey, we see you might be struggling here a little bit or, hey, have you thought about this course that you might want to take? But in order for us to do that, we need data about them. Yeah. But they may not want us to have that data. So it's this it's this tension of of um, having the right level of access and sort of building the trust that we're going to use this data in a way that's intended to help them. So please let us have it, because if you don't let us have it, we're not going to be able to help you. But we understand that and respect your right to um, control who sees it and, and what's what's going on there. I'll tell you, card swipe data is fascinating uh, yes. information on a campus. Yes. Like, and yeah. anyway, hundred percent. And then students find out you're using card swipe data, and they're yeah. sort of like, "You're using that data to determine like where I should be going, or on the campus, or where I've been." And 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 it raised all kinds of really interesting, important questions that I to to the point. I don't think institutions had been prepared for. And there's a new data awareness right, that this generation has, and they're bringing those questions with them to institutions. Mm -hmm. so. so one thing, there's a little side chat going on about um, the use of uh, the distinctions between paid and unpaid um, versions of generative AI. And Dave, Dave, maybe you can weigh in on that for a moment, but also then I'd also like to kind of pull together of like, you know, is AI like, creating greater divides even on your campuses in terms of of your students and how can we really come back to build using ai um to promote equity in teaching and learning so yeah. dave you could start with the uh the sure the, the the paid and free uh, you mentioned uh divisions on the campus with students uh let's also talk about faculty uh you know as part of that and that's actually yeah. where we're really seeing uh, very different perspectives on the use of AI. But back to the question about free versus paid, it's a problem. Uh, it's it's a it's an actual you know it's a problem. The cost models. Uh, OpenAI just announced their education uh, product based on the work that they did with ASU and some other institutions. There, you know, we're looking closely at that. We've been talking and working with Microsoft, but um, you know, it would cost us one point eight to two million dollars to provide the full paid version for our entire student population, in addition to what we're already paying for other things. And we just don't have that. But we understand. You and that's know, five thousand that, students. Not that's right. That's right. So <laughs> how, does it, how does it scale? Um, but then you really get into the equity issue of well, what if the the more the student who has more affluent is able to to buy it. So we're struggling with that. We're looking at trying maybe to set up AI exploration centers where um, people could come in and use computers that you know we license it on the computer so that uh, the student can do that. But that has other challenges there. Um, we are exploring all the products out there, whether it's Claude or or the uh, you know open AI or, 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 or Microsoft there to try to to solve the problem but uh, it reminds me of some of the earlier days of you know do we provide laptops to students and, and devices and so this is sort of the next iteration of that and also I think the technology is changing I do uh, recognize that there is a real cost to the providers for every transaction at least the way it's designed today because it's happening up in the cloud and as the models change, where some of that computing happens more locally, I'm also hoping that uh, that changes some of the equation as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, it's interesting. We're, we're in the work that we're doing with our um, faculty in, enablement and, and design platform, Curie, we are work, we're working with several institutions to figure out how to use really everything that happens. All of our AI is trained into our data lake. But now we're working with institutions to train into their data lakes so that they can be pulling, so faculty can be sharing um, pedagogy and experiences and learning experiences and, and, and et cetera with each other, but pulling it out of their, their institutional data lakes. And I think that's really, I think you're going to have to be very targeted about where you are um, pointing that use of AI, whether it's free or, or paid, right? 
Well, and I, you know, when I was at Arizona and we became a, the first creative campus for them in the Western U.S., we yeah. went in on every student, faculty and staff would have access to creative cloud. And that and that is not an inexpensive investment, as you can imagine. Right. But the the interesting moment for us was digital and creative literacy is the future of how people are going to be thinking. And they're working in a multimedia world now. So going back to Dave's questions, what is the core value of the institution? It is to empower students to be able to work in a world in which this is a reality. When I got to San Jose, we had already had that license because they had done it across the system. And we're, tr but interestingly, the, infrastructure challenges are around then that investment. And I yep. think that, but to the point, and I saw it in the comments, none of us are budgeted for this future. Like there's no planned strategy here. And so it may be in our philosophical and ethical position to go make sure everyone's trained and has access, but how you produce that is absolutely one of the core digital divide questions that I think we're now facing. And we are much more constrained often by software access than hardware access. It used to be a hardware problem. That is not our core problem anymore. And so it's a really interesting turn. And I don't think higher ed leaders have completely been able to sit down and chew on this, particularly from the academic side. I think yeah. CIOs are having these conversations, but you know we're also dealing with all kinds of other things right now, but we're we have to tackle these questions. And I don't know the answers to all of them. I, I just know what the questions are, right? But we well, gotta get space for it. And Laura Sheehy here reminds us that we, we still have problems with universal access to broadband. A hundred percent. So like that before you even get to the super computing power, we still have, especially in rural campuses and yep. students who are online in rural areas, you know, or whatever, right? You know, so, um, yeah. We, we I'm, did I'm, work for this chair of the assembly of the state of California during the pandemic to show that students in rural areas in Santa Clara County, right down the street from some of the highest high tech companies in the world had no access to that. So absolutely, it's a core issue. It remains a core issue. I think it's really important for us to recognize where we are in this journey too. We are still just at the very beginning stages here. And I think that's, you know, it's so great we're having these conversations uh, and thinking about these issues. But as the hardware, you know, our, the, the next generation of laptops is going to have the processors built in to be able to do a lot of this processing local. And I, I'm optimistic, I guess, that that changes the equation a little bit, that we can provide. We have mechanisms, as Vince was saying, you know, we have mechanisms for providing laptops to any student that needs one, not a problem. Stop by a service desk, you can borrow it for the semester. Um, and so if then if we could run these more locally, um, you still have the problem of access to the data, uh, depending on uh, what data you're pulling into it. But um, so again, we're, we're just at the beginning, but I'm glad we're raising these issues and having the conversations with our vendor partners to try to address them. Well, Chloe in the chat raised an interesting question of the critical and analytic skills you know, that we need? Well, I would say that the critical and analytic skills is also how are we engaging artificial intelligence technologies? So if you think about prompt engineering and the emergence of the question, like how we frame questions in a writing program, as Chloe talks about, like, the question is, how do we start to teach students that you're interacting with these technologies and you can drive them somewhere and help train them? You can be part of that training process. It, and what is that criticality of what you're getting back? And is it ground truth? Can you really demonstrate that it's it's got accuracy behind or whatever kind of tech, what kind of evaluative tool you want to use? I think that's very important. And back to the equity question, if we're not having that conversation across the entire spectrum of higher ed, we are putting students behind the eight ball uh, uh, in the future. Yeah, and Finn, I would like you just to comment a little bit as from the point of view of a provost on, you know, how can equity, AI contribute to closing equity gaps in teaching and, you know, as AI in teaching and learning, right? Right. Well, you know, I think I think there's several ways. The one of which is 
obviously the ability to embed um responsive technologies into teaching and learning so students can iterate on problems. I mean, we all know in higher ed, high stakes exams are one of the traditional ways in which we actually create exclusionary practices as opposed to iterative learning. <laughs> and what machine learning has brought to Khan Academy, these other things is like this iteration to be able to respond back and forth and do it on your own time frame. I mean, one of the biggest challenges in higher ed and why online education went the way it did was being able to meet people where they are. And our traditional models of come to a classroom and then come to a tutoring session is very hard in an environment where people are carrying two or three jobs and a family and trying to go to school. So the yeah. embedding of these technologies and these strategies allow students to be more flexible in how they're engaging their teaching and learning. The second thing is, we can help faculty actually build stuff so that they can focus on, on teaching engagement. This is the thing when I first got into online education, the best class I've ever taught and designed is my first online course. And what I found is I spent all this time having deep conversation with students as opposed to worrying about all this background noise, which I thought was so important, which was my lecture, which is really you know, not as significant as all the other things you're doing. So all of these things start to play, but they all have costs, right? So how are we privileging that? And there's a fear that it replaces teaching. I don't think it does. It decenters certain practices. So how are we educating faculty to get back in the middle of the conversation, which we need them in because that criticality is what they bring to the table. And that's the relationship we have to kind of get to um, in order to build out these strategies. But we're holding AI in teaching and learning sessions. 80, 100, 200 people are coming. Um, and when we started doing our work in the pandemic, we had a thousand faculty sign up for a teaching and learning program and online education. And, and people are hungry for this stuff and want, us, and want support. And so it's incumbent on our institutions to be responsive to that. When we are, I think people are starting to see, all right, what are the different ways in which I I can do this work, right? Sounds great. Okay, I'm going to stop. Yeah, um, yeah. Sort, I'm, sort, sort yeah. of Vince, following up a little bit on that as, as a provost, so I'm the tech guy, you know, um, as a provost, how do you uh, work with your faculty because, um, you know, I think you'll have a continuum of faculty that are, you know, early adopters and, you know, all, all in. And then you have others that the sky is falling, that this is dramatically changing their, their relationship with their student. Um, but if we actually look at that through an equity lens in some respect, that a student who then starts really benefiting from the AI and, and the, uh, the help that AI provides them to be successful, has that in the classroom where the faculty member is embracing it, but doesn't it is not able to use the tools in the classroom where the faculty member is really saying no, this is this is not good. As a provost, how do you work with faculty to sort of uh, address that? Well, th this is a really really interesting question, and it's an interesting question for two reasons. The first is every there's never been uniformity in the way in which teaching and learning has happened in an institution and in fact i think that's very good for students because they're going to walk into a world and they're going to go to one meeting and some leader is going to organize it one way and another meeting and someone else is going to organize it a different way so i don't think i mean i think it's actually okay it it creates a discomfort but in my opinion discomfort is a learning moment the other thing is you got to let faculty think through their relationship with mm -hmm. this stuff. And what more? what is more important than, I mean, we offer the training, but not everybody wants to do it or wants to engage it. So if you're not going to, how are you communicating and engaging students in the why, right? That's the important question. Like, so we're not going to use these technologies and strategies in this class. Why? What am I trying to teach you by going a different direction? And that's the interesting question, I think. And then you create an environment where let's do diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, everybody should have that in their job description and everyone should be engaging in these questions. 
how you engage them is very different depending on where you are philosophically, pedagogically, and all these sorts of things. But there's lots of ways to do that. I think this is the same moment. And we have to create this reality that there's going to be these different ways in which you're going to comport yourself in the world, depending on where you are. But it's that honest, open conversation, I think that's right. really critical. You know what I'm thinking here? I'm sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, we should have done two webinars. What an ethics. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. But I'm going to turn us to a Padlet and uh, um, Brett's going to put it up on the screen for us when you get going. Kelly's going to put a uh, link in our uh, chat. And what I'd like to do is to hear from all of you. I mean, there's been a really great conversation, sidebar conversation going on here as, as there always are, which we love and we share with you afterward. Um, but here, why don't you, I would love to hear what you have to say about what your institutions are doing to promote equity and um, or and to advance ethical use of AI amongst your various stakeholders, which we're going to go into next. Nothing. Well, actually, <laughs> funny you should say that, but that's one of the reasons I was so excited to they get Ben and Dave here today because, you know, they've been thinking about this even for a long time, right? And they've been engaged in this. And, you know, and many institutions are really struggling to even begin the dialogue, right? Um, so uh, anyway, comments, as you see at the, uh, uh, Ben and Dave, if you see anything, you want to make any comments, please do. Well, the really interesting question is for me, you know, where where does equity and AI, machine learning and other things intersect, right? And we talked a lot about access, but I think it is about the larger ethical use questions as well. But the advantage that we have is in a multimedia world, how are we teaching students to tell their story? So I'll give you a practical example. Um, my colleague, Magdalena Barreras, our vice provost for faculty success and Adobe came in and wants to expand access to digital and creative literacy. And so she, with one of our faculty members at Chicana Chicana Studies developed a digital storytelling pedagogy program and a fellows program tied to our Hispanic serving institutions initiatives. So we got biology faculty now using digital storytelling in their intro bio courses to, and they can bring in AI tools through Adobe, right? Yeah. To build their story and it allows them to connect to their education. One of the biggest challenges we have in higher ed is that sense of belonging. And how do I fit in this world? Well, storytelling and access to storytelling that could be technology enabled is a really powerful tool that starts to lower the barrier and go, oh, I can be successful. I don't just have access. I can actually graduate. There's an outcome to this. And I think that's a game changer um, if we can take advantage of it. That's excellent. And I think, oh. you know, this is something Brett has really pushed in, in, in uh, you know, in all of the many AI webinars that we have is just this whole idea of you have to rethink assessment. And we, when we get into ethical use of AI, we can't, I mean, it's too often bogged down in the conversation about um, cheating, but, you know, the reality is that there are different ways to get um, students to um, uh, tran transmit and, and transfer their learning. And, um, and that that's part of it. Brett, have you seen, you've been looking at this, any themes coming out on the ethical use of AI side of this? Yeah, Carrie. Hi, thanks. Um, well, let me go on video for a moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as I'm looking at this and I'm seeing the reactions, I mean, one of the patterns that comes to mind for me is just the fact that uh, though these are critical topics, equity and ethical use of AI, there's also that critical need for a foundation of AI literacy across the board. And so for be able, people to be able to have informative and productive conversations in these areas, there really needs to be that base understanding, that comfort level, if you will, around AI and, and how it relates to their role how they operate going forward, and then how they approach that in a way that's equitable and ethical. That so I think that's why we're seeing so many campuses saying, well, nothing's happening or not much, or there's just this group talking about it. It's moving so slowly. But, you know, again, this is something we've only been involved in for a year and a half. As Dave said, it's going to continue to evolve. We'll see where it goes. 
So I, I think, um, you know, people obviously want to do the right thing always, but what is that right thing? How do I do this effectively? How do I do it productively with my students and still manage it in a way that's ethical? We might have to have this conversation again, like a year from now and then see how, how it's taken. Um, okay, let's take off the Padlet. I want to get into the uh, conversation about ethics and AI, because I know that the two of you have a lot to say about it. There but, is. Uh, yeah. Just before, I don't want to get to that. Just before you jump uh, to that, I noticed a few places in the Padlet, people were basically saying, we're not doing anything or we're sort of stuck in committee. Um, I'm going to pop two resources in the chat, as you mentioned up at the top, that I do a lot of work with Educause. Um, and uh, at, we, together we developed a uh, higher ed generative AI readiness assessment and also a action plan. And these two documents can sort of help give you a list of things to be thinking about as you are approaching uh, AI um, at your institutions. And I think that they can help you get unstuck because there's so many issues and so many things to be uh, 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 you know, looking at and stuff. So I. I I'll pop those in the chat and then- uh, thank, thank you so much, Dave, because, um, and by the way, I, I popped them in a uh, slide for to, to give back, but the, all of these resources and resources that are shared by the uh, team will be in, shared with um, all of you after this webinar. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, the, you, the work you're doing at uh, Educause is just terrific. Well, and I would say to that too, as we get into the ethics question, we are going to mess this up. <laughs> and and like yeah, yeah. the fear we have to make mistakes in higher ed, learning is about failure. I mean, we're trying to figure out how to embed that in our own teaching. What, get ourselves a break. Like you're going to muck this up. It's okay. But evaluate that, have the conversation. And then when you fail, pivot. Like, all right, it didn't work. That was a disaster. Like, We've got to live in that world because I had I, at this our academic senate faculty member said this is just a fad. I'm like, I am not a fad person. This is not a fad. This is a fundal fundamental transformation of social life. Like this is not this is how we're going to comport ourselves. So we got to get in. We got no choice. But we're going to muck it up. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You know. That's awesome. I I so. Love that you're getting you're seeing a lot of claps and uh, hearts and tears of laughter. Um, so what you know what AI related ethical issues should institutions explore and develop policies for? Um, and you know I don't know who wants to lead in with that. Maybe David. We, we've touched on a lot of it. I mean I do think it's it again it's around the data how we're using that. Uh, I do think that uh, each faculty member really needs to be very clear on the syllabus as to what their expectations are for their students and how they are using AI. I think we have to have conversations about how do we reference when AI is used uh, there. Um, also, you know, does AI enhance or replace the human piece of it? So like, do you use AI to replace a human thinking for a particular thing, or do you use it to enhance that? And then how do we, again, how do we note how we have used that? Um, I don't know, what do you think about Vince? Well, you know, I, so I've actually been writing and thinking about the question of what intelligence actually is mm -hmm. with some of my former students uh, from Arizona. I've been chewing on this question for a while. Artificial intelligence in my mind is neither artificial or intelligent, right? And and we give it too much credit, but I think you're right. More often, you when you talk to computer scientists, they're talking about intelligence augmented, IA, not AI. And I think part of it is we feel like we're giving everything over and we're not having the intellectual conversation of what is enhanced or extended or the opportunity. People are deeply frustrated, for example, about course scheduling here. Well, we're gonna, we have tools to optimize that sort of strategy. And and people and that actually is a success strategy because we'll have a better schedule optimized to what students need. But the, going back to your very point, Dave, the inputs of what the schedule is is human, 
right? And it's faculty. At, well, I like to teach this. But that optimization doesn't line up sometimes with what individuals want to do. So the question is then, this technology comes in, how are you mediating the conversation that this technology now demands? Which is, how do you think about delivering your education in a student-centered way? Yeah. And not based on what faculty would, might put as inputs into that. That's a really challenging provost moment on the floor uh, of the Senate, right? <clears throat> but they go, what? What do you mean my schedule is about the students, right? Yeah. You know, and not everything needs to be from 930 to three o'clock. Well, and also even student-directed learning, right? Which AI can really help. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, but that's something that a lot of um, higher ed faculty really struggle with because, you know, they didn't go through two years of a master's degree in how to teach. And, and by the way, in K-12, you're not seeing a lot of it either. So, <laughs> and they do do that, right? So it's very difficult. Um, I will say, um, this is a good one. Um, Laura Yost brought up a conversation, I hope I pronounced your last name right, Laura, about, you know, there needs to be a discussion about the tools themselves being unethical. And um, so any any comments on that? Dave? Well, that's why our, approach to hiring faculty is a, is also in this space, broadly speaking, of science and technology studies. We've launched an ethical um, ethical technologies institute or a college of humanities and the arts. We've got a computational social science um, minor, and we're building out at every level. And our engineering college actually even integrates uh, philosophy work on ethics and it's kind of core undergrad curriculum. So we're trying to create an environment where all of those questions are infused and we should be challenging and asking questions of these technologies. Right. And that's what higher ed is supposed to do. That's why I think we're actually excellent partners for tech firms because we can come to the table and be a laboratory for sort of asking those core questions. Is there racial profiling within the way in which your technology is being built that we're going to ask a question about that you may not? One of the challenges, and I've been in many meetings with many tech companies here, is they still have that Facebook mentality. We're just building something. We can't, you know, it's just the background to what's right. happening. And you're like, no, you have a responsibility here. And that's why the AI for social, so, civic and social good with the city of San Jose for us is so important because we want to say we want to be a city, a region, a place where ethics is always in the conversation with any technological advance. But it is challenging in an environment where the technology is moving much faster and the U.S. is not caught up to Europe, you know, when it comes to privacy and questions of technological ethics and so forth. We have a much more open environment. I want to just quickly reintroduce something I said earlier that I think the size of the institution uh, has an impact as to how an institution is thinking about it. At Ithaca, it's challenging for us. We don't have the depth of resources necessarily to have all those uh, conversations uh, that uh you know, that larger institutions do. And that's where, again, looking at an educause or something I think can be helpful. I know there's the HECVAC, which we use to assess security. And I actually don't know, uh, but I would love to see an equivalent uh, tool like that that's used for ethical, uh, looking at the ethics of how the AI has been trained and the resources that are used. So you sort of have an industry scorecard almost that gives you an idea. Uh, so that institutions don't have to have some of that skill set or do some of that um, research uh, themselves. Scales yep. important. So here's a question for Maureen Larson. Should educational institutions concentrate on building their own custom LLMs by topic so that we can ensure students have accurate AI tools or would that be prohibitive in cost and time? Any thoughts? I have a lot of thoughts, but David, even more yeah, I mean, CIO. It, it, 
again, it's a it's a scale <laughs> issue. I think that you know we have some faculty that are very interested in doing that, and we are trying to provide them with resources to do that. Leverage some of our student employees as well uh, and, and expertise uh, uh, for that. Um, I'd be interested, Vince, how you're doing it at a larger institution. I mean, we certainly have those things going on. The challenge has been always with local building. Let's take AI out of it for a minute is yep. the depth of experience to maintain it. So there was a question, while well, equity, you seem to be talking a lot about access, 100%. There's a success component to equity, a sustained conversation of creating an environment where people can have access to resources and create environments. But the biggest, biggest challenge in building on your own is, great, do you have the infrastructure then to maintain it? Um, and that has always been an institutional problem, particularly if you're small or even a big public and working on the marginal dollar, right? Where there's no investment in this. It doesn't come in the FTES, the full-time equivalent student funding model that comes from the state of California. It doesn't go, hey, AI is really important. We should add a little money for every student to pay for that. Like it doesn't happen. So it's all coming out of the same money, right? And that's really the rub in all of this is how do you do that? So you're constantly balancing like local builds and partnerships. And what, are the, what does that relationship look like? Which means you really need an ecosystem map that says what technologies are we letting in the door and how? And that, that goes to data governance and all the other things and building infrastructure around that with an equity lens at the front end um, of that. And I don't think many institutions have that built, right? Um, it produces a challenge, I think. I also think you want to look at uh, piloting or proof of concept. I can see doing a local build on that just conceptually, and then you look for a partner to uh, take it from there. Okay, I'm, I'm going to wrap this with a final question, which is for each of you, what are your parting words of your advice to academic leaders who are kind of saying, we haven't gotten started yet, or we're not there and we want to be there? You know, what elements need to be in place to advance equitable and ethical use of AI? Um, and, and just kind of each of you end with that. I think uh, some of it is you take the technology out of the equation and you really just look at equity and, and ethics. And, and, you know, what do we need to do to ensure that our, all of our students have the same ability to succeed? Um, and that we're doing it in a way that uh, is above board. People have control over their data, um, whether it's with AI or, or, or other things. The other piece is um, there's been a wealth of resources that have been developed, not just by EDUCAUSE, but by a lot of organizations in the last 12 months. And I think they provide frameworks for us to look at uh, to get going. And so I think that uh, leveraging those resources out there to help you intentionally think through this, uh, um, it would be time well spent. Awesome, Ben. Every single campus has people already working in these spaces or thinking about them, every mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. And so as a provost, for example, the chief academic officer or a dean, you don't need everybody. You need the people who are starting. This is, a, you know, in anything. Back to Dave's point, this is like a lot of things. And we're creating a moment around it as if it's different, but the strategies are not that different, which is who's asking the questions? Who can you get in a room to challenge you in your job as provost and say, for example, or dean, like, how are we going to think about this? What is the curricular impact? What, how do you as sort of leaning into this already, want to help others? And then what's the infrastructure we need to build around that so that we have those thoughtful conversations, that we push for open source technologies and things that we know ethically we can align with to our institution? That's the kind of thing that I think starts to change the game because you're elevating the conversation in an environment where it's okay to say, I don't know what the answer is. I just know there's a really, really important question here. So let's have the opportunity to engage it. And I think that's the thing that gets, that drives and motivates. Uh, last thing I say, you know, when online ed happened and everybody's like, you know, 
should we do it? This is before the pandemic. I'm like, almost every PhD student who now is a assistant professor has probably taught something online as a graduate student. Like this whole notion that like this is, you know, different than what they're being trained in this space already. This is the same thing. Our our new faculty, our new staff, they're going to already have worked in this environment where they come to us. They're actually going to show up and go, why don't you have this stuff? We had all this stuff in my other job, you know, as a graduate student. And that is an interesting moment as well. And if you don't start those conversations with those new people and and the senior people who have been thinking about it for a while, you lose you lose an opportunity, I think. That's great. Well, I this has been a great conversation. And I'm like, I think we need to revisit it a year from now <laughs> and see how things changed. But I so appreciate both of you joining us today and 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 uh, give, giving your advice and and you're you're clearly leaders and you you've really done a lot of work thinking and and research on this. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks so, for having us.